Hotep, I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore Peace, host and producer of OmniU Presents the H3O Art of Life show. The title of this show is, and the subject is, mathematics. I love this. I love it because I know so little about it that I can rely solely on my guest who has agreed to come on and handle the matter for me. His name is Byron E. Bell. Hello, Byron E. Bell. Um, and I, Byron E. Bell, you know, has been in my community and in, in my environment for so long that I kind of took you for granted. And uh, you were just a young man who was a teacher of something called math. And it never occurred to me that you were doing the kinds of things that you're doing. When I, I got your curriculum vita and I started reading your publications, at some words, I thought I was going to have to look up in the dictionary. I mean, I just said, you know, this is, this is profound. I have a grandson whom I have to introduce you to because he would love you more than ice cream and cake. But at any rate, I need to, we need to find out how you came to this specialty. Because obviously, you know, math is something that we are told we don't actually either have an affinity for or the, um, the, the, the makeup for. You know, we, we just don't have an aptitude toward math and it's a subject that we struggle with and so forth. So now here we have somebody who eats, sleeps, drinks, and lives in the world of mathematics. How did you come to this? Where did you go to school? And how did you come to choose this as your profession? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Peace, for allowing me to be on your show. I like to give thanks unto my ancestors. I'm an ancestor. I worship the ancestors. I get up every morning and I give thanks to my ancestors, my mother and my father. I have a lovely wife who's a teacher in the public schools. But to answer that question, when I was a little boy, and I went to um, Meyer Bradwell. I used to love to do arithmetic. And I had a teacher by the name of Elaine Island. And Mrs. Island was so inspiring. I used to do fractions and decimals with her and under her. And my mom saw that I had this special talent. And all of a sudden, my mom used to give me her tablet with all of her bills on there. And I would add them up and everything. I thought I was just adding numbers. She was testing me to see if I really knew this. Um, next thing I know, I was her regular adder and subtractor of doing the house bills. I became older. I would go around with the people that came into my mom and owned the six flat building. And owning that six flat building, she would have um, contractors come in. And I used to come around and have to negotiate with them and do the calculations and negotiate for the building of certain things and she would let me handle all of that. So math was very easy for me. I didn't know, I just did it. When I went to high school, I was trying to get off into being popular. That didn't work. Some of the people ended up not getting jobs, going off to jail and doing other things. I went to Circle Campus, flunked out, didn't know anything really about how to really study. Went to Kennedy King College, stayed there three years. That's where I really learned how to study. And when I learned how to study, that broke open by a man named Robert Sanders who's out at Chicago State right now. That man, Robert Sanders, um, Donna Craig, and another guy, took me for about two years and molded me. I thought that they were, we were really investigating something. I didn't understand that they were molding me. I thought we were really studying quantum mechanics. I thought we were really studying electrodynamics. I thought we were really studying um, chemistry and physics. No. These older brothers and sisters sacrificed their time to bring me along into math. I, I can't say thank you to them enough. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be where I am today. 
I'm traveling over the world, I'm writing papers, I'm investigating very, very involved subjects. And one of the things that you want to um, probably, okay, my undergrad degree is from Northeastern Illinois University in economics. My minor was mathematics, my um, concentration was macroeconomic theory. I'm very interested in large scale phenomenon and national economics. My minor was mathematics because I wanted to go on and get a PhD in mathematics or a PhD in economics. To me, I couldn't see the difference between economics at one point and mathematics at the other because I took a lot of statistics. I went on and I went to Chicago State and re received my master's in 2007 in mathematics. My master thesis is a mathematical regression of the gross private domestic investment from 1959 to 2001, where I looked at examining the economy and seeing how much companies invest in um, the stock market and get a return. And I wanted to see was there a correlation with the national economy, and it was. Well, I later went on and I started doing some work about astrostatistics. And that's the combination of astronomy and statistics. And I know a lot about statistics. And that's what I've been doing, working in astrostatistics, combining the observation of astronomers, of astronomers and statisticians. And that's known as a new emerging field known as astrostatistics. And that's where I am now. Well, for one thing, you were mentored into where, in, through the early phases of where you are now. But who told you to take on these lofty subjects? Now, it's one thing for somebody to help to inspire you to have a love for a discipline. It's quite another for you to just immerse yourself in it and just go in every direction because, I mean, now you're an astro. <laughs> you know, you weren't satisfied on this plane. <laughs> you, you have to go into the stratosphere. Why? Well, one of the things that happened was I went to a conference soon after I received my master's in 2007 from Chicago State in mathematics. And I went to present basically my paper on my master's um, project, my master's thesis, which I already told you it was on in economics. I got there, I met a black astrophysicist, mathematician. I couldn't really understand his um, talk. It was very heady mathematics, and I couldn't see the results of it because he didn't have any numbers along with the mathematics. Whatever I do, I would show you math, and also, I would show you numbers that come with it. I didn't see any numbers, so I was really lost. I could understand some of the mathematics. So I came back to Chicago, talked to my friend who is an amateur astronomer, an, am, am, excuse me, an amateur astronomer. He told me, what can you do with that data? I said, well, with this subject. I said, well, I don't know very much about astronomy. But if you gave me some data and you told me what it is, I may be able to make an um, equation around it and give certain projections and certain observations and certain results. And he said, well, can you get those, um, that data? I said, maybe. So I started looking around about apparent magnitudes, about redshift, about um, quasars. Well, let me start from the beginning. A quasar is when you have, is billions of miles away from Earth. And it's like the black hole that is pulling this star matter and breaking up stars and eating them up. And it's the colliding of gases and chemicals in space. And it creates these plumes of light. And from these plumes of light, in the green light, um, green light, ultraviolet light, red light, more red light, and even more red light. And we have not even talked about x-ray um, light. We haven't even talked about other types of light and spectrums of light that they have special filters for. I'm just dealing with the optical light, which is dealing with 
ultraviolet light, green light, red light, more red light, and even more red light. So I haven't got into x-ray or to infrared. That work is so involved, I haven't even got to out of 1905. I'm doing some work right now of taking Einstein's cosine direction. So in other words, if I see a certain phenomenon occurring, I took an equation, pointed in that direction, and trying to see what is happening with that light spectrum. And that's what my work is centered around right now in the synopsis. What will be the social value of that information? Well, there's really no social value. There possibly could be an understanding that we may be able to, uh, I'm hoping to do what Chick Anta Jope talked about, the Senegalese physicist, anthropologist, um, linguist, um, and most people don't know that he was a trained nuclear physicist. He talked about when the work of thermonuclear fusion goes secret, it will be cloaked in secrecy. The people that creates first a first a thermonuclear fusion reactor where we won't have radioactive uh, material but we can produce energy without any side effects based upon water we have an abundance of energy forever no side effects no Hiroshima's no Nagasaki's we we'll just have energy forever and basically run off of water that is the challenge and that's what I'm hoping that we can study from these thermonuclear phenomenons in space to glean an understanding of how we could maybe harness that energy on Earth. That's the social value. That will, that to me represents the salvation of man, of humankind. Yeah. Because right now we are dependent on fossil fuels and all kinds of things. When you mentioned the side effects, you know, for the benefits that we get, the side effects are enormous, you know. So to, to be working on something that will just, you know, will be maybe a small piece or a small portion of this problem, you know, is commendable for you. I w when I was at Northwestern, I had a professor. He was my linguistic anthropology professor. And he spent most of the class time with his back to us working on an equation. And he wrote from one end of the board, and these, this was a linguistic equation because hmm. he was trying to break down uh, some language that had to do with the Hopis. And so he, ha he, had, he, he was, tr they, they were using um, known entities, known words, known vocabulary to try to determine what unknown elements were. So he had this, he had a, an equation that he started at one end of the room and he just wrote all across the board, all around the board, <laughs> you know. And uh, he spent most of his time, we had our work to do, and he had his work to do. He spent most of his time with his back to us. And he was working on that because that was very, very important to him. And he, he, but we were also working on some aspect of it. We weren't working on the whole thing, but we, we each of us had our own part of it that we were supposed to, to, um, to try to decipher, or at least offer some suggestions. And the simple suggestion that I discovered was that what was baffling him was some form of the, the article T-H-E, that, that was never going to turn into a concept. He kept trying to get it to turn into some kind of concept, but it was not going to ever turn into a concept because it couldn't, mm -hmm. not based on all the stuff he had given us to study and all that he had given us to read. Now, that you know, he was throwing up confetti and all very happy about it. And I guess I was very happy about it. But the thing is to just find the the in the whole universe of discourse. So in just for you, if you just find the 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 link or you just 
uh, eliminate the uncertainty about the phenomena that you're discovering, some aspect of the ph phenomena, that moves science forward, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And that's what scientists do. Yes, they do. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> Thank you. That's well, um, currently in my work, I was able to do in my first work about quasars, I was able to see anywhere between an 80 to 90 percent correlation between apparent magnitude, what we see on the Earth, and um, distances um, based upon cosine direction, based upon taking an, a telescope pointed within a certain um, spectrum of these quasars and looking at how far they are and um, their behavior. Then my second paper, what I went to Ireland for, was to take that phenomenon and put probabilities to it. And then that um, correlation between the, the, deep, the independent variables, in other words, what went into that equation and what we see c coming out of that equation, being able to predict certain phenomena, what is the probability of this occurring, went down to 75%. But still, that was 75% correlation between the independent and dependent variable. Therefore, there is a 25% non-correlation there. So it's still further work, but I still think that's pretty good. I think that's pretty good, but you know, you use the strange terms. Uh, you said math and numbers as though they're not the same. And I, 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 I had to stop and, and ponder that, so since I didn't come to any any real satisfying conclusion? I want you to explain to me how you would say you math. You would separate math from numbers because I can't think of math without thinking. I mean, of numbers. Not, it's, it's, uh, but there are certain people that just deal with theory. Oh. And this one guy that was in Boston, all he dealt with was theory and no numbers. No numbers at all. I was confused. How can you talk? theoretically about something that is number based without using any numbers. Einstein did all the time. Oh, excuse me. That's why, but when I look at Einstein, see what I have to do in my mind, I'm an applied mathematician. All right. If you show me an equation and there's no numbers to it, I'm going to put a number to it. All right. It has to have a utility. If it doesn't have a utility, why do I need it? Do we just do numbers just to be doing numbers? Those are for theoreticians. I do have a degree in mathematics, basically pure math. But when I was taking classes at Chicago State, some of the professors didn't like me because I would always say, how do you apply this? And I had one professor, he's the chairperson now, I want to name him, and he said he was about developing a general level of understanding of mathematics. Fine and well. I'm about understanding how to have a general level of mathematics and also to utilize it to make the world better and, a, and to understand it from an application standpoint. Okay. You spent too much time in Northeastern. <laughs> Because, you know, scholar activists believe in applied knowledge. You yeah. know, what is the point in sitting in an ivory tower <laughs> pondering, you know, how old the horse is, open his mouth and count his teeth, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so you are, you are practical, practical. Uh, you have inclinations to be practical. You Absolutely. really want to do something. I remember having... Uh, been told in junior college that I had an aptitude for math that was greater than my ability to do math. And when you mentioned had learning how to study, I had no one teaches studying. That's right. You have study hall, but study hall is so that you can sit there and get as much, have as much fun with your at, with your classmates as the study hall teacher will allow you to have. It is not so that you are learning how to study or that you are studying. So I didn't know how to study and I had a friend who was excellent in math who was trying to teach me and I was just drawing a blank and just frustrating him tremendously and finally he said, Gloria, where is your mind? <laughs> because it was not focused on what he was showing me. 
And finally, he was able to get my attention. He was able to get me through what it was he was trying to teach me. And I, was, I, I did much better than I had been doing. And then I got, um, I got very interested in math. And, and at one point, I sat in the library until it closed because I was trying to figure how to work. I was trying to work the equation, the quadratic equation. And when I finally started getting them right, I was so thrilled that they had to throw me out of the library because I know you get a lot of satisfaction from math. Yes, I do. You know, don't, no, I, you can't even try to pretend like you are doing this because you are, you are socially conscious. You are doing this in part because you get a lot of satisfaction out of discovery, yes, don't you? Yes, I do. Um, I, I'm also teaching at Kenny King this semester. And I went over the quadratic equation, and the students saw me, and they said, "Mr. Bell, why do why are you putting this equation on the board? And you're showing us this stuff with no numbers. Everything is a symbol or an X or A or B or C." I said, "We're going to go from the general to the specific." Mm -hmm. So I went from the general to the specific. I went from a x squared plus b x plus c equals zero all the way to that. Famous equation, x equals out to a minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So derived all of that. Then I said, now that's completing the square. Now we're going to take a general equation like x squared plus 4 plus 1 equals 0. And I showed them how to complete the square and find out the two roots or the one root or if it has no roots, the characteristic of the discriminant. Um, which would be, um, you have the x-y coordinate, you have this um, equation that can either go across the x-axis, maybe touch the x-axis at one point, or touches it at two points. And those are the three conditions that you must have in a quadratic to find the roots or determine that they have no roots. And so you are having all this fun and getting paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> I do love math. I don't know why um, Robert Sanders and Donna Craig, um, I, I, I still amazed. Why did they give, give up so much of their time? They fooled me. They, I thought they were going to really, we were gonna really do something. But I look back on it now. You and I'm did like, really do something. You got a math professor <laughs> out of the deal. That was something. But they didn't get nothing out of the deal. Oh, why not? Well, they me, replicated themselves. <laughs> <laughs> they cloned another mathematician. <laughs> Robert Sanders, you know, years ago, um, I was at, you have also in my curriculum, Vita, about me going to Argonne National Laboratory. Right, I um, did read that. Yeah, mm -hmm. years ago. And I was at a conference before that where I presented that same paper on dimensional analysis. And he came to Northeastern Illinois University up at the North Campus many years ago. Mm -hmm. And we were in a um, room up at the North Campus on the second floor. And he turned to me and he said, i never forget he said this. He said, brother, I knew you was going to be a teacher of math. I said, Robert, how did you know that? I knew what you were doing. I said, okay. I knew when you was going to be a tutor. You knew when I was going to be a tutor. No. He said, I knew this day was coming. Made me cry. How did he know? He saw how much I was in, I was very much thrilled by the discovery in love <laughs> discovery <laughs> i never forget that i i was before my mom died i lived with my mom and she was just a lovely woman jenny bell and i would come home and i would draw these pictures draw draw these equations it was four leaf um equations eight leaf equations limachans that's a funny word for a snail in mathematics and I would show my mom that, and she would say, oh, these are all lines. And she would look over and say, these are all lines. 
But I had a lovely mother, and she never stopped me from learning. She didn't necessarily understand everything, but she encouraged me, and um, I truly stand on the shoulders of giants. Well, you know, there's a book called Blacks and Science. Was it Ivan Van Sertima's book? Ivan Van Sertima. Yeah, um, because aside from Dr. George Washington Carver that we learn about in during Black History Month, uh, we don't get a lot of that. We don't get, we get to hear about Percy Julian. We get to hear about Charles Drew with this all in the context of Black History Month. And it really isn't made clear that these are scientists we're talking about. You know, these Ernest are- Ernest Jess, the Black Apollo, he's a biologist. So, how do we how do we interest young blacks aside from some people just taking a promising young student aside and mentoring him and tricking him into be <laughs> growing up to be somebody how do we get young black people to take an interest in science and to learn to love it to learn to love as you say discovery to learn to 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 First of all, want to know how to study, want to know how to discover, yeah. because that's what studying is. Studying is you're studying. Actually, I've, I've said, and I think it's true, you studied, st we study to learn that which we already know. Somewhere inside of us is all that ever has existed in the universe. Yeah. We can discover that only by introspection by study. We have to study in order to find these things that we possess. How do you, how do you ignite that, that, that flame in young people? When you're teaching at Kennedy King, for example, math is a subject that I think that some students would not take if it were not required. That's true. And they certainly wouldn't take um, after algebra and geometry, you know, that's your, your required math. Folks are not trying to go toward trig and calculus, you know, because the fear is that they are so difficult and they're so unmanageable that you're going to mess up your grade point average <laughs> and you're not going to be able to get into college. So just take your required math and stay away from those other things. Statistics. That was frightening to me when I was working on my doctorate. And I was fortunate to find Joseph Pentecost, who could speak statistics like you speak your ABCs. <laughs> I mean, he understood statistics so well that my professor uh, could not read the charts for my doctorate. Because Joe Pentecost helped me to develop charts that were just just complete, they, they were just com so intricate that my professor said, I can't read this. What? Give me something that I can read. So we had to simplify the charts in order to be able to show the correlations. So this was beyond bar graphs and um, no, pie charts? No, he needed, no, Joe Pentecost was a statistician. And he, the charts that I had, if you go to Northwestern and look up my dissertation, they are in the appendices because they were not permitted to be a part of my dissertation. In the body of the work. In the body. They were, so, they were too complex. They could not be understood by the chairperson of my committee. <laughs> that's something that, 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 that's interesting that I sent in my abstract and I sent in my full paper to the chairperson of the International Astrostatistics Network. And I was, I filed first to go to the conference as a poster presenter. Um, so I called this guy up and I was telling, I said, well, I'm, 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 I'm gonna be coming to the conference and things, his name is Joe Hilbury. And Joe then informed me, he said, Byron, you know you're not a um, poster presenter no more. I said, what do you mean I'm not a poster presenter? He said, Byron, I looked at your paper. It's way more than a poster. You are now switched to the contributing session. 
I said, Joe, are you saying I'm going to be on a panel with other people? I said, yes. He said, your paper is quite heady. Um, and he left it like that. Everybody on the panel had a PhD except me in Ireland. Well, what were you doing there? Well, I went to <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're telling me that you were the only person on the panel that didn't have a PhD, obviously you belonged on the panel because yeah. they would not have put you on there had you not been capable of being a participant in that panel. Well, I, 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 I knew what I was talking about. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, what was the poster? What, what does that mean, a poster? Well, a poster means basically that you're going to just have like maybe something that's um, 17 by maybe 20 feet or something like that. It's so high and then you have the information that you're talking about and then you're going to stand outside maybe for about out in maybe the corridor with other people that's on a plaque and talk about your um, discoveries and your research. Okay. And you're not going to be within a main session where the main session may last an hour and then you may have like 25 minutes to talk. Okay. So that I, means you would be standing out pretty much like a child at a science fair. Right. And people would be walking by and you'd be explaining your science experiment That's and right. they'd listen That's right. for as That's long right. as they were interested and then That's they'd right. move on. That's right. Oh no, that would you, why would one want to go all the way to Ireland and do that? You were willing to do that though. Yes, I was willing to do that. Okay. But this man who lives in Arizona, who's a retired professor of philosophy, but also went back and got a PhD in statistics, believed so much in my work and he thought it was cutting edge. He said, oh no, you have to come here and actually present. He gave me, I had the last slot okay. in the last um, session of the Astro Statistics session of the World Congress of Statistics in Dublin, Ireland. And I presented for 27 minutes. Did that include questions and answers? Yeah. Okay. And you did good questions. Yeah, I answer questions. Okay. And then also two British companies came up to me and asked me to write book proposals. Okay. So to possibly write a book. Okay. Is so the I'm book coming? On, the book is coming. The book is coming. Have you given it a working title? I'm looking at the um, a mathematical regression of um, quasars. Could you give it a popular title so I could want to read it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I need to do what my good friend Hunter Adams did back in the 1980s. Okay. Make a popular book about um, African Americans and Africans um, and how we contributed to the science of astronomy and astrophysics and astrostatistics. Okay. And how we can utilize that on a popular level. Okay. I don't know how to do that yet because okay. I'm not an astronomer. Okay. I'm, 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 a, I'm a mathematician that has studied some statistics okay. that utilize astronomical or astronomy data. Okay. Do you, have, you have not met Kalan Phil Koran? I met Phil Koran, yes. You, there's some interesting information available from him, mm. you know, because he is an astronomer and a real serious one. Anyway, I wanted to I wanted to ask you about a publication that you had um, that had to do with Harris, Frazier, and Bunch. How three black intellectual giants from Howard University wrestle with racism. Because believe it or not, no matter what it is you choose to do, if you are a black person, you are going to encounter some racism somewhere along the line. Oh, absolutely. And you discovered it um, and decided that you should, you should deal with it. So tell me a little about that. Because Ralph Bunch, I know the Bunch, you have to be talking about Ralph Bunch. That's right. Okay. Okay. 
Those were the, they called them the Gang of Three. There was a, that's the original Gang of Three, okay. not just talking about China. Okay. These guys, E. Franklin Frazier, Ralph Bunch was a professor of political science from 1928 to 1945, 19, no, really 1950. And he, re, he retired in 1950. Um, Abram Harris was a professor from 1928 to 1945, and then he went to the University of Chicago as a professor of economics. That's what they were telling the world. But really, he was a professor at the college, teaching nothing more than undergraduate classes in philosophy. This man is really the forerunner to the black conservative economist Thomas Sowell, as well as really the founding member of the black radical Marxist-Leninist group of radicalism in the 1920s and the 1930s. And he wrote the book um, Black Capitalism. He also wrote a book about um, the black worker in 1931. That was his dissertation. Um, that he um, wrote on. And by 1938, he writes no longer on black issues. He writes only on economic issues, institutionalism. He comes very aligned with a man named Frank Knight, who was the chairperson of the economic department at the University of Chicago. By 1945, he leaves Howard University as a visiting professor. 46, he is appointed actually as a professor at the University of Chicago, and he stays there till his death in November 1963. And posthumously, a um, article comes out in 1964 talking about the 100 years of emancipation and um, economics. That's what um, he also wrote about race. But by then, he had made this um, transformation from this radical black um, Marxist to this conservative forerunner of Thomas Sowell. And, um, but his works are excellent. We don't know very much about his activities in Chicago. I heard about from like 1948 to 1951, he set on the What's the birth control um, organization? Planned Parenthood. Planned P Parenthood. He was on board of directors here in Chicago on that. Um, but other than that, um, further research needs to be done on Abram Harris. Now, Bunch was way ahead of his time. Bunch was a, people don't know he was a statistician. He wrote the that famous, um, ideology, political ideology um, that led to um, the work of Gunter Murdoch's 1944 really? work. Really? That 3,000 page memorandum, the 3,000 page memorandum that he headed up the study in the South. It was sent to Gunter Murdoch to do the work that laid the, help, laid the foundation. For American Dilemma. Yes, 1944. Did you know Ralph Bunch did also, he went in South Africa in the 1930s. He went to Northwestern first. He went to the University of London School of Economics. Then he went and did um, field study in South Africa. Came back and met Gunter Murdahl, who convinced him to do um, some preliminary work for him for American Dilemma. My undergrad degree is in economics. <laughs> I can see. <laughs> And this Harris person? Ah, uh, okay, um, okay. I no, I talk Frazier. To Frazier. E. E. Franklin, Franklin Frazier. Frazier, the Negro Church in America, the yeah. Negro people in the United States. The, I've read almost all of his sociological work. That's right. And see, people really need to understand that if you're going to deal with Cruz, Cruz is really a Frazian. Really? If I was to categorize Harold Cruz, Cruz really is a person that aligns himself to Frazier. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the crisis of the Negro intellectual, he took that title directly from out of his 19, from out of Frazier's 1962 work, The Failure of What? The Negro Intellectual, mm. which one of, was, was one of his last works. Because mm. he dies in 1963, if I remember correctly, or oh. maybe 62 with cancer. He did a two-time stint under the Applied Social Science Division in the UN. He writes the famous um, 
black bourgeoisie in 1957. I think he also retires from Howard in um, 57. Um, he did the cooperative movement studies when he went to get his master's at Clark, um, not Clark in Atlanta, but Clark, I think, in Massachusetts. Why do I associate black bourgeoisie with W.B. Du Bois? Because um, the, the talent of the tenth. Okay. You're talking about the talent of the tenth. Okay. Yeah. The intellectuals. You know, that's what raises up the um, educated um, populace that's going to deliver the masses, the black so bourgeois. So how do they wrestle with racism, these three? Well, at that time, Frazier was coming from Fisk. He helped defend some young people that was very much against the anti-lynching in Fisk. And um, he comes to Howard and also to the, um, the 1933 um, Amina Conference, Spring Guard that deals with the issue of blacks and the New Deal and the Depression. He's there, Ralph Bunch is there, Abram Harris. Abram Harris creates, a, and it's called the Harris Papers, a whole new relationship and how he wanted to turn basically the NAACP into a workers organization. Mm -hmm. That would never happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that never happened. Mm -hmm. Bunch wanted to try to find, define this relationship between blacks and the workers of the world. And Frazier was coming, of course, from off of this binge of finishing, I think he finished his dissertation in 32 from the University of Chicago. Mm. If I remember correctly, his dissertation, wasn't it the black family or the black church? The Negro family in America, the Negro church in America, the Negro in the United <laughs> States, you know, that's Frazier. That's Frazier. That's what I said. If I remember correctly, I think it was the black family, 32. And he studied under the famous um, Robert Park, University of Chicago, mm -hmm. that founded the Department of Sociology there. And he comes to Howard. Those men created a well storm a protest there why at howard <laughs> at howard bunch a traditionally black <laughs> <laughs> university bunch had students lined up in front of congress with um nooses around their necks the anti-lynch law that's right okay they wanted to get rid of him badly. Okay. Um, Harris was writing papers about um, revolution, and, and not, rev not necessarily revolution, but economics and from a Marxian standpoint, mm -hmm. and how to deal with this new deal. It was, it was a great time. It was radical. Very radical. Very radical. I probably would have been a student of um, um, Harris. <laughs> I would have probably also said it uh, at that time. Let's see, who was there? Um, Harris was there, Bunch was there, and then the guy that basically founded African Studies that they gave it to, Ian Franklin Frazier, um, Lorraine Hansberry. Hansberry. Mm -hmm. um, Hansberry was there. Her husband. No, no, her uncle. Her uncle. Yeah, Lorraine Hansberry's uncle. Um, William Leo Hansberry. I thought her husband was the Hansberry. And that, her and that husband. How, isn't that how she got the Hansberry? Okay. That's her maiden name. That's her maiden name. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think her father was like a real estate tycoon in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And her uncle was a scholar that never received his Ph.D. Um, in Egyptology. I think that he had a Sloan Foundation scholarship. He went on several digs and very bright man, but never had a chance to get 
the PhD, went off to England. John G. Jackson told me the story. Okay. I was, you know, I was just about to challenge you because I said, now, here is this man sitting across from me, barely a half a century old, and he's talking about folks graduating from places in 1932 when he was no place around. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that you can study. You, lo you love to study, so I know yeah. that you have studied. But if you've been hanging out with John G. Jackson, then that, that's pretty much... Uh, uh, a class in and of itself. Oh, I would never forget that he had a um, triple integral problem. He used to do calculus. John Jackson? <laughs> yes. Really? Yes. And some type of way he substituted a particular um, variable in and it reduced the problem down to one page. How long was the problem before he inserted the variable? I think it was about variable? three or four pages. Okay. He so was quite a man. I, I agree. I agree. He told me he sat down and read for 20 years before he wrote. Yes. You know, now that, that's just amazing. Hubert this Harris, point. he studied under. there. Jay Rogers. I heard of Hubert Harris through my godfather, Theodore Valentine. Uh, Valentine? Theodore Valentine was my godfather. Did you know Theodore Valentine? The old dark skinned man that, 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 that the, was a, like. The, the, Af the round table for yes. the study of African American yes, I knew history. Him. I caught him on the tail end. Yes. Okay, okay. He praised Hubert Harris because Hubert Harris was never appeared in Negro History Week. <laughs> no. We never heard about him. But he made me aware of Hubert Harris, and he was quite a man. Didn't they tape off um, Wall Street? They're talking about the Occupy Wall Street now. Right. But he, they taped off Wall Street because the masses of people was coming to listen to him to, back to, in to, 1920s. To lecture. That's right, to lecture. You, you knew I was around. Dr. You weren't Jackson. around in no night. No, no, no. You knew I was around with Dr. Jackson. I had to hear from Dr. Jackson. Oh, I didn't know you heard that from Dr. Jackson. I heard Dr. it from Jackson. Theodore Valentine. I heard it from Dr. Jackson. Right. So you really have had a good time because you've been able to study and, and learn about all of these phenomena and all of these personalities and so forth and so on. And then you can aspire to grow up to be like them, <laughs> you know and go all over the country, well, all over the world, actually, when I look at your curriculum vita and see where you've been, you know, you've been everywhere. What were you doing out at Argonne? Argonne was one of the first places that I went to and I started doing some work on dimensional analysis, looking at variables and then you have certain variables that are in dimensions, therefore you group these variables together and from that they create a, their own phenomena. Therefore, you may have certain variables or things that occur and they may act similar and that, that creates a dimension. And then you may have certain other variables that um, are similar and that creates another dimension. And therefore, you could see the phenomenon happening in dimensions, just not variables. Those variables come together and make dimensions. Like they talk about string theory, that there's probably maybe 11 variables now that deals with just not the sheets or the equations, but these phenomenons that are happening now are um, in dimensions. Or they talk about um, like water may be on a, um, what's that, a bathroom um, shower curtain. And that one um, water may, that one water spot, one drop, may, one drop may be a whole nother dimension. And that's why they had the large hedron collider right now, where they're looking at these other phenomena at very, very small particles. You're living in a different world than the rest of us because most of us are not looking at a drop of water on the shower curtain and seeing it as anything other than a wet shower curtain. <laughs> <laughs> they call them bangs. Okay. And that's a woman out of Harvard University, um, Lisa Randall. She's doing some work um, out of there. I met some of the top people when I went to Tunisia 
um, one woman, she's an astronomer, doing, looking at the um, beginning of the universe and um, things of that nature. Um, that's not really my area, but I could probably um, do some work in that if I'm given the data. And if you've probably given some support, because I'm sure that some of these people who are doing this, these uh, studies have grants. Yes, they do. It, it, takes, it takes money. One has to work for a living to pay you know, for normal expenses of living. And if one is going to take time away from that to study, somebody has to be keeping them afloat. You That's know. True. So are you planning to apply for grants? I just missed work? the opportunity to apply for the National Security Agency's grant. Um, I was I have like four classes I'm teaching and it was just too much of a load. I'm gonna see if I can um, apply for a conference grant and create a conference of black statisticians and people who specialize in um, models and maybe to be held um, I was talking to my chairperson at the Paul, maybe to be held at the Paul if we can get the monies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like to call them together, um, have them meet, and then I would like to have maybe some later time to have another conference on just astro statistics in Chicago. Could you go do a conference on the state of the economy? We'd like we'd like some answers. <laughs> yes, I could. We, we'd like to, we'd like to look at the you know t t t some work that you did. We'd like you to revisit. Let me see what was it having to do with the the uh, there's something that you did here a mathematical regression of U.S. gross private domestic investment. That's uh, my master's thesis. Well, okay. Now this was 2007 that you made this presentation so we could take a little update okay as as to what is the, I don't understand I just do not understand what is going on because it, it just appears to me from a layman's point of view that there is no amount of revenue that is going to be sufficient not to always to have us uh, in some sort of deficit, you know, it just seems that a deficit is just a, a n natural part of this economy. That it just, you know, if you have an economy, you're always going to have less than what you need to run the economy. But I, I don't. I don't understand very well. I, I don't understand the gross national product or the budget or the deficit or the how we can owe so very much money. Because I'm saying, well, are we the richest nation on the planet? How then? Who are we borrowing this money from? Okay. Let me try to give you... Give it to me in about three minutes. Okay. Okay. First thing to understand, there's a difference between deficit and debt. Okay. Like anybody in a household, when you overspend, you have a deficit. Okay. When you go and borrow the money from somebody else to pay off that deficit, you create a debt. Okay. So the United States has a debt as well as a what? Deficit. deficit. Then you have the complication comes in on one hand, that's created by the government, mm -hmm. the uh, deficit. On the other hand, we have, um, that's known as fiscal policy. On the other hand, we have monetary policy. So how much money is going to flow through the economy or how much money is not going to flow through the what economy? That's controlled by an organization called the, the Federal Fed. Reserve. That's right. Fiscal policy and monetary policy, okay, all right. I can see right now I'm in over my head <laughs> because obviously you would just think that one, one entity would be in control. Of, it's sort of like your husband coming home with the paycheck, mm -hmm. you know. So somebody in the household, maybe it's the two of you or maybe he puts, leaves the bills up to you like your mother did leave them up to you and you had to do all the adding and tell her how much was owed and whether or not there was a deficit 
and whether or not there, a debt need to be created in order to meet this deficit. But these, these are entities. These are all different entities. You, the Federal Reserve is dealing with the monetary pol policy, and then you got the fiscal folks over here. And That's the government. The government. And who's, uh, who is the tail wagging the dog? Is the, <laughs> is the Federal Reserve wagging the, the government, or is the government still in charge? or is the Federal Reserve even a part of the government? It's a quasi-institution. It's a quasi, it means it's... Quasi-government it's, 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 it's a... Some government and some, it's private banks that have an interest in a government bank. You know, I, I should have asked this question way earlier in this conversation because I'm pretty sure that I would have a much greater understanding if I let you loose on that question. <laughs> <laughs> the, the answer is that there is a morass. There is a maze. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I don't want to get lost in it in the last few minutes of the show. But I'm very glad that you came and gave us a role model so that oh, I, can, I can at least show the DVD to my grandson. Oh, and God. Tell him, tell him he, he, he did a rap song when he was in college. He had a radio show, and he did a rap song on, on the string theory. He did a, because he's very interested in science. And um, I was very interested in what he was doing, and I, he was talking to me, and I was greatly interested, and he said, you know, this is so cool to have a grandmother that's inter interested <laughs> in the string theory. But I'm very interested in you as a young man and, and your development because I can see that it's still going on. And I hope that the next time I have you on the show, I can ask you the right question at the beginning so that I can, well, I did ask some right questions, yes, but did. this one having to do with the economy and the monetary policy and the fiscal policy and the difference between deficit and debt and all of this kind of stuff, I would much would have enjoyed. Net imports and things of that nature, and we have to deal with that whole thing. Okay. Okay. You did something with investment, too. I was an investment banker for a while. Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. All right. Well, and now that's that's and the reason I'm not in that field is because of the racism. 